very happy to be here. It's actually, I think, our like second event that we actually participate in person. Uh, so that's lovely to be here and uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, just as a quick introduction, my name is Paula Grzegorzewska, as, uh, as our, uh, our friend here said, uh, and I'm a strategic partnerships director. And with me there is Astor Numelin Karlberg, who is the executive director of Open Forum Europe. Uh, and just a quick word about Open Forum Europe. Uh, we are a think tank based in Brussels and we've been around for actually 20 years. So we have been working on topics of open standards and open source for quite a long time. Um, but we are also working on some other topics such as cybersecurity or data uh, and privacy. Uh, so if you have any thoughts on these topics, uh, feel free to you know just let us know and let's have a discussion. Uh, and we work with a very diverse um, stakeholders. We work a lot with policymakers, so with the European Commission, with the European Par Parliament, uh, but also with the member states, um, SMEs, industry, and open source foundations. We see some friends in here uh, today in the audience, and I hope online as well. Um, so maybe let's uh, let's jump into the actual topic. Um, as I said, we have been working on open source for a long time, but now there is a there's a big uptake of open source as an idea among many European governments. And there are many diverse reasons for that. Uh, so I'm going to uh, pass it on to Astor, who's going to tell us a bit more about why governments are interested in open source so much and in institutionalizing open source. Um, yeah, so... Um Essentially, like, uh, yeah, maybe before we get into the like big question of why engaging in open source, um, just because we use the term OSPO all the time, it might be good to just explain it for those that don't engage in this topic all the time. I think most of the ones engaging with open source know about it, but it's the Open Source Program Office. Um, so kind of the, the institutional construct, uh, the, the center of gravity for open source in an organization. And, um, uh, in the government, I would say, uh, and I'm saying in government, so in the public administration and government organizations, um, this creating these is kind of where it's the cutting edge of open source engagement of the public sector. The uh, uh, the you know another way of seeing like open source program offices in government is. Um, one can almost see it as like, that is how you take open source seriously today uh, if you're a public sector organization. Um, what it looks like, we'll get into a lot of these different things, but essentially it depends on the strategic goals of the organization when it comes to open source. So it's quite similar to the private sector. You set up goals through your strategy and you have an OSPO supporting you in achieving those goals. Um, and yeah, we'll get into the different examples, but um, you just this might sound a bit abstract, but um, also mentioned that this is not just a pipe dream that we have thought up in Brussels in our think tank, but this is fun. Uh, these are actually being built. Uh, in November 2020, the European Commission started its OSPO. The city of Paris will launch its OSPO in the near future, so is uh, the city of Dortmund here in Germany. The French government launched its OSPO now in November 2021. And just four days ago, the World he Health Organization la launched its. Uh, and we're seeing, and these are the ones that we can kind of publicly talk about. There are a bunch of other ones in cities and countries that are discussing this right now, and there are different levels of plans. Um, and since we're in Berlin this week, and we'll end this, this presentation with talking about what's happening in the German federal government, because there are some quite interesting developments, and maybe they require some reactions from people listening to this. We'll get to that later. Um, yeah, so as Astor said, probably most of you know what an OSPO is. There are slight differences between a governmental OSPO and a private sector OSPO. So, you know, just so that we are on the same page, the, the role of a governmental OSPO is of, you know, you have a person to go to when you have a question about open source involvement and whether it's about finding new funding, whether, whether it's about communication with different projects and communities or open source foundations whether it's about training or just you know, letting developers within the team know, okay, you can work on open source this amount of hours per week and just you know, structuring it so that everybody knows that they can actually do this and what is the goal of the open source involvement within a government or you know, a particular institution. Um, it's also about advocating and communicating with other OSPOs. So this is a bit a dream of ours to have a network of OSPOs and we know that uh, the industry is doing it quite well. Um, 
but it's also about the collaboration between the different offices because they usually have quite similar needs. It's, it's something that we bring up quite a lot. Um, you know, when you have a city in Germany and when you have a city in France and a city in Poland, they usually have sort of similar needs. Like, their citizens need to register at the, the local, um, at the local uh, governmental agency. They need to get similar services. So why not share these solutions and, you know, why not do it together? Um, but there are also a bit more strategic goals. Um, so, yeah, back to Astor. Uh, yeah, and I think this is uh, there is a long history of these like open source competence centers or you know different structures in governments uh, that have engaged with open source. But usually, it's it maybe a bit mean because there are some good examples, but with a pretty weak mandate, not a lot of funding, uh, not a lot of strategic thinking uh, behind it. It's just kind of like yeah, here's the person if you have a question about open source. So the idea of the OSPO, it's also I think you should think about it as. Um, um, a strategic construct. It's there to achieve and accelerate policy goals. So uh, if you're a government organization, like you set up the policy goals and then you, uh, the ones that are related to maybe not just open source, maybe also open data um, or just engaging with uh, digital in general where open source is like part of the story, it should be built to help drive the organization to achieve those goals. And this can be like systematic policy goals, including privacy, security, trust, diversity, participation, access to technology. Um, for example, there might be, you know, heavier focus on these in the public sector than in the private sector. Um, but also, of course, the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, dealings with software development, uh, development and maintenance, uh, or maintenance, because I mean, at the end of the day, we have big dreams for. OSPOs in the public sector and what they can do at a systematic level, but it's also at the end of the day, it needs to be relevant for the organization itself and bring value and not another bureaucratic level, but just add value to the organization. Uh, one, before you change, there's one thing that's really important to point out, and it's something that we'll get to our, our uh, the study we made for the European Commission, but one, well, one thing that we identified as a big barrier, and I think most of you know this, who have engaged in public sector open source, is this idea of cultural change and having a culture that can actually kind of embrace the different working methods and norms of open source community and open source work. A very important thing that we've seen with the OSPOs being built now, and I think this is very promising, especially if you take the example of the European Commission, it's built to be a driver of cultural change within the organization and just you know, promoting and advocating for new ways of working and kind of be someone to hold in, <laughs> hold in the hand when you step into new territory and working in new ways. Uh, also, you know, outside of your organization or collaboration. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we discussed a bit, you know, like why, why the governments are doing this, but um, the question is also why now? Why actually now it's become so, you know, a bit more on top of the political agenda. Okay, I wouldn't say it's on top, but higher up. Um, but actually, it's uh, you know the term of digital sovereignty has gained a lot of traction in the last two or three years, and you know it's it's one of the main keywords that pop up when we talk about digital policy as such. Um, and there is there is there are different ways to understand digital sovereignty. It took us a long time and to understand what we mean by that. Every country understands it differently, every office understands it differently, and every paper that we see understands it differently. But for us, um, a big chance is in perceiving digital sovereignty as a way for openness and for more choice and for control, but control that we see as, you know, that can be achieved through open source. And this is something that we see that the public sector is starting to notice, that we don't have to use the, the, the more digital sovereignty idea that is closed and just, you know, usually national or regional, but it can also be just more connected to the, to the world. Astor, do you have something to add on this? Because actually, I think it was your part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it ju just a bit there, there, there's, uh, you know, control is a tricky word in the context of open source in general, but I think uh, um, actually opting to go more open looking to kind of more decentralized control of technology and having insight into the technology and the stack of what you're actually using is something, um, and increasing also as the, the government is one of the biggest users and consumers of digital products, like increasing the sense of control and real choice as a consumer and as a user. Uh, open source, it doesn't necessarily solve everything. It's not a panacea, we're not saying that, but it is a good starting point and it does solve a lot of practical issues that um, um, public sector organizations are facing.
Um, and I think uh, things that are changing quite quickly uh, now is kind of the different arguments that we hear from, from uh, um, policymakers on why open source is an interesting tool to, to use in, in um, digital policy in general. So I think a lot of old arguments that uh, for the ones who've been engaged in open source policy no, everything from you know, reduced lock lock in and um, uh, reduced cost in some, in some situations as well. But um, uh, we feel like there are a new set of arguments that are resonating with policymakers now as well. And I think uh, the first one here, the sharing and reuse uh, uh, with speed and at scale, is a fairly interesting one. Sharing and reuse uh, has for the last 10 years been used by the European Commission as kind of a synonym for open source uh, because it was politically sensitive to talk about open source, so they called it, called it sharing and reuse. But the, it, we experienced something quite interesting um, uh, during COVID. I think on the one hand, open source as a methodology and innovation was underutilized uh, under COVID. I think things could have moved a lot faster, but in the situations it was actually used as a methodology by policymakers, it worked to very dramatic and interesting effect. If you take, for example, the, you know, when we came in here, we came with our Belgian uh, green digital, what are they called? The, the COVID <laughs> passes, it, you know. Um, you, you know, all countries, we have our own app. They're all interoperable. We scanned it here with our Belgian one through the German scanning app. It worked. This is actually the biggest, you know, public digital service that has ever been rolled out, ever, and at that speed. That speed and scale, it's never happened before. And how did they do it? Well, through open source. The commission realized, and this is because of a lot of good work that's been done by open source advocates and policy, you know, people in the public sector who's interested in this, to actually, the understanding had reached the point where it's like, well, we can't do it in any other way. It has to be open source. And that kind of collaboration of ensuring from the start interoperability across borders enabling travel, that there were no glitches. It's a fairly interesting example. On the second point on transparency and trust, it was also example, you know, to stay with the COVID example. In Ireland, they released, you know, the COVID tracing apps, um, you know, at the early stages of, of the pandemic. I think you guys remember these. Um, the, the, um, in Ireland, um, they, opted to go for open source. After some discussions, debate, it wasn't that simple, but they opted to go for open source. And what they realized, and it uh, you know, awakened a lot of policymakers, that they released the code for inspection by the kind of hacker community in Ireland, who responded very positively. They took a look, they were like, yeah, nothing nefarious here, looks good, it's not like overly you know, uh, privacy, uh, you, know, uh, you know, bad for our privacy, this is, we can back this up, and then, the Irish hackers community went out publicly and said, yeah, we support this. And that helped their rollout completely. And there was just a way, and they saw that as one of the big game changers in terms of like getting the public's trust in using this app and downloading it. I mean, it's just one anecdotal example, but you can see that this is relevant to almost any digital public service that you would engage with as a citizen. Um, yeah, cybersecurity, I see it's already moving up a lot of time. That's a long discussion, but just like an OSPO can be very interesting, and this is how it's being discussed in understanding what software is being used by my public organization. What are we using? This part is using maybe this commission, the European Commission is engaged in this now, to just completely just go through and map who's using what, contributing where, and to get a sense of where you know, the organization is in terms of open source. That is, of course, very important in the case of, for example, a situation like the log4j vulnerability to know what do we use and where. Um, and then economic growth. And I think this is one of the biggest game changer and how I was very involved in creating a lot of the arguments around this. I mean, I was involved uh, in a way that uh, I was a part of the team that uh, conducted the study on the impact of uh, open source for the European Commission. I think that probably many of you have heard of it because we really made it a point, you know, to try to promote the, the results that we came up with. So hopefully you've heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Um, but this study uh, was conducted by us, OFE, uh, but led by Professor Knut Blind from TU Berlin. Um, and the goals were basically to find the economic argument for using open source and what economic and social impact it has. Um, I was responsible more for the part on the policies in the European member states, 
uh, which brought very diverse results, uh, but this is not uh, necessarily the, uh, the topic of this, um, of this talk. But uh, what we have found is that, I mean, there is a significant growth opportunity in terms of open source for the European economy, just in pure terms of GDP. Um, so yeah, here is a small QR code uh, where you can check, um, check the, <laughs> yeah, it's quite big, um, where you can check the, the study. But um, I just chose a couple of snippets to, to mention. So uh, over 8.2% of the 3 million employees in the ICT sector contribute to GitHub. It doesn't sound like that much, but it's, it's quite a lot of people. And there were over 30 million commits to GitHub in 2018, which is equivalent to 16,000 full-time employees. And over 1 billion euros personal cost was invested in Europe in people who are contributing to open source. And what is quite interesting, um, is that mostly the contributions are coming from small companies. I mean, this is a, a pretty European thing because in other, in other regions, and actually I know that uh, in the US a similar study is being conducted and looked at, uh, but in Europe it's mostly uh, small companies that uh, contribute and individual contributors, uh, which is also quite um, corresponding with the general European economy. Um, but when it comes to the numbers, uh, we came up with the number that Open source is contributing between 65 to 95 billion euros per year to the European economy. And this is huge because this is from half percent to 0.7 percent of the European GDP. And this value is actually more than air and water transport combined per year. So this is huge. And the question is, you know, how do different governments engage in this? And how do they support the industry that is producing open source and that is, you know, how, how are they supporting communities and what can be done and should be done? Um, and of course, there is more to open source than, you know, just like contributing to the economy. But this is the, the result that we have found out and that speaks to policymakers. Um, so, yeah, here's, uh, you know, just the points. Uh, brought together. Um, and what is also interesting is that, yeah, increasing globally available open source code by 10% would increase EU's GDP between 0.4 and 0.6%. Uh, and of course, the, the point is that, you know, the study is European, but it's not that easy to limit analyzing open source just to Europe, because of course contributions are coming from different places and are influencing different places. So that was the biggest challenge in the, um, in the study, but uh, we did all this analysis and then we came with policy recommendations that we have transferred to the European Commission and uh, that we are also discussing with uh, other governments. Uh, and we go back to Aster now. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, just uh, one way of seeing this economic impact, it's, uh, and the concluding from a government perspective that open source is a public good, uh, it justifies government involvement and action and attention at a completely different level. And this is not, I wouldn't say that it's just our study and suddenly people are reacting. This is something that the study, let's say, supported and there's been uh, quite a lot of just increased attention. The OSPO uh, trend is part of this. Um, um, and here the, the question is uh, one of Okay, so open source is important. It has a cost-benefit uh, ratio of one to six to one to 10, meaning that one euro put into open source, um, and by that it means like something that supports contributions to open source, uh, which is an important detail, I think, to mention, um, gives back uh, between six and 10 euros to the economy in terms of GDP. So this is a different way of arguing for open source for the public sector than has been used in the past. And I think taken together, it starts to paint a very interesting and attractive picture of why open source should be taken seriously by governments. So that comes back to what we started talking about in the beginning. How do you take open source seriously in the government? And then we argued and um, put forward that OSPOS is one of the most interesting tools out there as an organizational construct to increase the capacity of um, European government and public organizations to take this seriously. Uh, it's all about institutional capacity and a vehicle to do a bunch of different things. We don't have to define what all those things are yet, but we have to start building the institutional capacity to do the step one and two, and then starting to create the thinking to understand step three to 10. Uh, 
So yeah, um, let's see, where are they? Is it the next slide? Ah, uh, yeah. So this is a short summary of our OSPO re recommendation. Um, it is very much um, <laughs> talk about Europe here, but that's because the study was for the European Commission and that's their jurisdiction. So uh, I don't think that these conclusions necessarily in any way end or are especially relevant to Europe. They're relevant across the globe. Um, um, but yeah, so if, if you take a look at this, it's we try to give it a kind of systematic approach and one step at a time. Because there are already, as we said, a lot of action happening. But we recommend that the Commission takes these five steps um, in the context of um, increasing institutional capacity in, in, um, uh, of the public sector. So we said the Commission has an OSPO. Um, we want to give this uh, OSPO a mandate and an explicit networking component that it is, uh, it is doing quite a lot of good work for the Commission itself in terms of its you know, open source compliance stuff and it's all good important things. It's good for the, you know, uh, making the Commission a good kind of open source citizen and doing the work properly. But we think that this should be more ambitious. Also give them the task to network Europe's public sector OSPOs, but maybe not even just the public sector OSPOs. Also working with vendors, working with um, OSPOs in just other organization. Consider the OSPO here an interface through which you connect with other open source enabled organizations. Um, we wanted to, this is a very kind of advocacy kind of point of view, but getting the OSPO uh, uh, make it sure that anything that touches software in terms of regulation or legislation, be it copyright legislation or whatever, run it through the OSPO. Make sure that they get eyes on the early drafts to make sure there are no unintended consequences um, uh, for, for open source software development in the world. I don't know if you know about it, but we spent three years trying to save open source software development from the copyright directive. Um, we would like to not have to spend three other years on some other file because somebody made a mistake. Run it through the OSPO. Uh, the third step, um, yeah, identifying and mapping. Uh, we mentioned a few OSPOs in the public sector. I bet there are a bunch that we don't know about. There are also, let's remember the kind of multiplicity and plurality of languages across Europe. I bet there is an OSPO out there that is just called something that is not all the OSPO. Um, which is also a recommendation, like call it an OSPO. It helps for everyone <laughs> involved to identify you. Um, but make a proper mapping and kind of see who's out there. But then uh, we think that the, the economic impact justifies spending. And specifically on OSPOs, we think that it should be kick-started in the public sector. Um, there's enough of momentum now to start even building best practices. It's early days, but at least it's a first step. But we think that the public sector, and here in this case, the Commission and the EU through its funding programs, should um, uh, build support. Details here need to be worked out exactly how to incentivize this. But create 20 OSPOs through a funding program across Europe. This, you know, a lot of details and discussions need to go into this. Where do you place them? Do you start with cities? Do you start with national governments? Uh, do you work with universities? Like, what are the limits? We are not, we think that they're, all these areas are interesting. We have some ideas of what we think is best, but it's definitely an open for discussion. Where should they be built? But support and build them. Uh, give teams the kind of support over time and mandate to build this up to increase the capacity, I bet. There will be way more application. There will be hundreds of cities and governments and different agencies that will apply to get this support and funding. But part of getting this funding will be you have to add an external networking component to your OSPO and be part of the European OSPO network. And hopefully, network effects will, after a while, take its course. And more people will see this as, like, here's the group group to join. And we think this intervention is needed um, because it took industry maybe 15 years before they formal slash informal like kind of organized properly. See, to do group is here. But it were like when they really got together and started networking and getting the effects of that, it was informal. But like setting these things up, we think we can leapfrog this in governments and build this in from the start. Um, learn from industry, do it differently when needed, but start you know, get a push, it's justified to get that critical mass. So, 
well, so, um, now there might be someone here who knows more about this in detail, but I've talked about to some people in the last few days, but, so Germany and the last government, they were about to build the biggest, the most ambitious government OSPO in the world. Uh, it was very interesting. It had a very high level strategic goal of engaging, you know, um, with the Euro uh, European, but especially German, of course, uh, open source industry to really just amplify the ability of the government and the, uh, to just deploy and use open source across the, the federal government. Digital sovereignty was a big thing. It was called, the it is called the Center for Digital Sovereignty was created as a concept by the last government. Two days ago, the new draft budget came out and it has been gutted. It has been de defunded. A lot of reasons for this, a lot of discussions back and forth. I mean, you know, budget setting is difficult, but um, I think that if there's, if I was cared about open source, especially open source in the public sector, I was German, I would call your MP. It's now with the parliament, to adjust this, I, you know, I'm not gonna pretend that I know exactly where people stand, but start talking to your MPs about this. This is a big thing. Talk to organizations like the FSFE, OSBA, get the latest information about what's happening, get engaged. I think for all of Europe, building this super OSPO in Germany, it would really put Germany as the leader in the space. So, yeah, go do it. Also now France sees themselves uh, as you know the leader in the space of open source policies because of our report. <laughs> so uh, again, encouraging. Uh, do we have time for a Q and A? Yeah, we, this was kind of with three minutes or something. One or two questions. <laughs> so earlier you spoke about digital sovereignty. And I've seen a lot of different definitions in there um, that have come up. Like, I know when we talk about it, it's always been so open and gorgeous and I love it. And then I'll hear some other people do their interpretation of it. I'm like, oh my God, I don't like this. Could you tell a little bit more about more in regards to the, the, the context that you're using it in to explain where, um, because you know, I care a lot about governance, as you can tell from the other previous questions that I've asked. And it seems like sometimes they want to make the governance almost locked down to maintain the sovereignty. And that doesn't seem open. I mean, I have to say that. Watch this space. <laughs> the next Tuesday, we have an event on this topic if you really want to get into it. But yeah. Yeah, it's exactly this topic. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there are also so many synonyms. You know, we've, we've started by using technological independence <laughs> or technological autonomy. Then, you know, digital sovereignty has become like the term to use. Um, but Astor, I'm sure that you want to add. I mean, yeah, I mean, okay, so, um, it is tricky, um, especially, like, in many ways we see open technologies, to start from the kind of tech side, we think that open technologies, be it open standards, might be, uh, you know, open, let's not just talk about open source here, the open standards part is incredibly important when it comes to control and real choice uh, um, uh, for governments or uh, industry or any user of their technology to be able to switch bet between vendors. Um, the way we approach it is very much looking, kind of going through the stack of like tech engagement of a user. So OFE, we have this user-centric uh, uh, approach. That's how we try to analyze things. And um, we saw it as like a link between like technological um, um, over-dependence on certain technologies lead to an over-dependence on certain vendors which then leads to all the other things that we start describing and is being described as um, a lack of digital sovereignty or lack of control, et cetera. So we, in our perspective, kind of boil, boil it down. You know, it can be a lack of competitiveness, a bunch of, bunch of different things and all the different definitions. But in our view, um, and of course we see it like this because we work with open standards and open source, but it does come back to the problem of over-dependence we don't mind interdependence, because uh, I don't think the goal is to be a complete island that is disconnected from the world. It's more of a question of a shift on the spectrum from what, you know, because many of the concerns in many areas are real and should be taken seriously, where there is over-dependence on certain vendors. And what's interesting with it is just where open technologies generally come in, because they can really help from a technological point of view to just 
increase that choice and turn that overdependence into just nice, good interdependence where we work together on things. So that's kind of how we see it, really, the details. I mean, it's a good chance now. We can actually join, the, join this event. We're taking, we're, 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 we're uh, you know, we have two nice panels, senior people from the commission coming to talk about both what we've talked about here, the public sector's uh, control of its technology stack, which comes with a bunch of extra, like, responsibilities, et cetera. That's an interesting conversation in and of itself. But then we're also starting to ask the question, okay, but on kind of a grand scale, how do, um, where are we with open tech when it comes to the future of, of, of standard setting that will you know, shape our industries? Um, what are, how are we talking about, let's say, that you know, digitization of traditional industry? There's one way of just like, oh, get everything in the cloud, but maybe it's not just that quantitative. We also need to start talking about the qualitative differences. How do you digitize? What approaches? Do you go for high upfront costs and then low, you know, you've heard these discussions before, but you know, uh, total ownership costs. Like all these questions also need to happen at that macro scale now where all industries are going digital. So we're trying to capture both these sides of the discussion. Um, and yeah, hope you'll like it. There are some Germans there as well, like from the BMWK. It'll be interesting to hear what they have to say.